Good evening, everyone. I'm Mike Kensler with the Auburn University Office of Sustainability, and we thank you very much for tuning into this webinar. As you'll hear in a video in just a couple of minutes, we're one of 100 colleges and universities around the world that are holding similar conversations. Our favorite climate scientist, Catherine Hayhoe, says the single most important thing we can do to address climate change is to talk about it. And that's what we're going to do tonight. Solve climate by 2030 because scientists keep telling us we have till about 2030 to stop putting so much greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and start drawing them down before we start to see even more significant consequences. So we want to have a conversation tonight about what we can do here in Alabama to help bring about a green recovery, identify climate solutions, and create a just uh, transition into a sustainable economy and society. And to help us do that, I'm going to introduce our three speakers, and then we'll show you a video. After the video, um, each of the speakers will speak in turn. And while they're speaking, if you have questions, uh, type them in the Q&A. And if you see a question you like, you can vote it up so it'll rise to the top of the questions that'll get asked when all three speakers have, have presented. So kicking us off tonight will be Alan Booker. And Alan is, Alan is founder and executive director of the Institute of Integrated Regenerative Design. Going next will be Daniel Tate, who's the chief operating officer for Energy Alabama. And then we'll hear from Nina Morgan, who's the climate and environmental justice organizer for GASP, the Greater Birmingham Alliance to Stop Pollution. So one other thing I'll say before we get started is the idea of this is either to catalyze or to energize conversations that are already happening in our state about what we can do to do our part to solve the climate crisis and create a more sustainable, just world for everyone. So with that, we'll show this video and then get into our presentations. Welcome to the Solve Climate Global Dialogues. You're participating in one of 125 events held across the planet, including in almost all 50 US states, part of a global project called Solve Climate by 2030. My name is Eben Goodstein, and I'm an economist and director of the Graduate Programs in Sustainability at Bard College in New York, the lead organizer for Solve Climate. This last year has been difficult for everyone. As the world looks forward to recovery from COVID, we are focusing tonight on the most important question facing humanity. What can we do in this year in our regions to help solve climate change while supporting struggling communities that have faced widespread loss of life, economic disaster, and joblessness? Worldwide, from Australia to Kyrgyzstan, from Colombia to Malaysia, and from South Carolina to South Africa, Solve Climate audiences are hearing from local experts and young leaders about concrete steps that can really help nations solve climate change while creating much needed jobs and incomes for everybody. The year 2020 was one of the two hottest years in human history, bringing with it massive forest and grassland fires, record-breaking storms and hurricanes, and relentless rising seas. Solving climate is the challenge which the human species must now face. There's hope for the future. Solutions have continued to advance. This year, China committed to building a carbon neutral economy while the US rejoined the Paris Agreement. Solar, wind, and battery prices continue to fall while major car companies have been rushing to electrify the global fleet. Worldwide, movements for Black Lives Matter and Me Too are leading in bringing much delayed and urgently needed justice to the world. Time is short. We have until 2030, 10 years to solve climate. We can get a lot done in this decade. We have the solutions, but only if we focus the world on climate solutions and justice, and then do the work we have to do in our own cities and regions. For students listening, you are the leaders. Without you, the future we envision will not come. I'm asking tonight for your help. We're going to discover powerful ideas for climate solutions and climate justice and how you can be a part of the solution. 
But this message must reach beyond those of us who are listening right now. Would you ask all your teachers this week in every subject to make climate a class? The teacher can assign tonight's webinars homework for the students and then afterwards have a one class period discussion. And we mean every subject from art to engineering, psychology to business, dance to chemistry. Teachers don't need to be a climate expert to lead a discussion about climate change. The Solve Climate Project has easy to use teacher's guides in nearly every subject and in three languages to help teachers make climate relevant to their class. It only takes courage. Don't take no for an answer. Ask them why not. This is your future. You'll be surprised how many teachers will say yes and thank you. Imagine you, thousands of leaders like you around the world asking their teachers once every school term to make climate a class. That means every term going forward, hundreds of thousands, millions of students worldwide in their classes talking about climate solutions. COVID has shown how fragile our global economy and society are to extreme events. It's also shown that vulnerable people are facing the hardest, most damaging impacts. This is also true with climate change. Science has made it clear that unchecked, Global warming will mean an unending onslaught of extreme events, causing untold suffering for humanity and all creatures, species driven to extinction, a planet of environmental refugees. And yet, in many ways, this is the most exciting time to ever be alive as a human. We have the tools and networks and technologies to rewire the world with clean energy, reimagine the global food system, reinvent transportation, and regenerate forests and grasslands, and be well on our way to solving climate by 2030. Tonight, we will learn how to do this in our own cities, our own towns, our own regions. Thank you for the work you will do to promote climate solutions and a just world. There's no question every act we undertake makes a difference. And so to kick us off, Alan is now going to talk to us about the green recovery portion of this conversation. Alan? Well, good evening, everyone. Let me um, bring up my slides real quickly. There we go. Well, you know, I have. Um, I've been an engineer now for about three decades, a little over three decades, and I started looking at and trying to figure out how we were going to solve some of the larger scale problems that we're facing. Maybe about 20 years ago, I started realizing exactly how much damage a lot of our built environment, a lot of the way we were designing the infrastructure of civilization, you know, how it was, how it was being done. And, um, you know, over the last few years, uh, the climate crisis has really gained a lot of visibility. Um, and um, there's been, you know, a lot of discussion. But from my background, having studied systems engineering and being a systems engineer for almost three decades, um, I can't really look at, at the crisis of climate in an isolated fashion. Um, it, to me, really is just one symptom of a really much larger set of issues that we're looking at. Um, you know, if you, if you go to the doctor and, and they're trying to figure out um, a problem and it has half a dozen different symptoms and all the doctor's interested in doing is prescribing medication to try to manage, you know, one symptom or the other, then the likelihood of getting down to the root cause of that problem and, and solving it so that those problems don't keep coming back goes, you know, is very low. And so, you know, I'm looking around and I'm saying, yeah, we're, what we're, what human technology and human civilization has been doing to the Earth's biosphere has been systemic. And climate is just one of those symptoms. You know, we have um, a, a, we've gotten to the point now where human, uh, the biomass 
on the planet is now weighs less than the amount of technological artifacts that humans have produced. We have taken the amount of natural biomass on the planet and have really reduced it by many estimates by more than 50% over the last few centuries. In so doing, we have unbalanced a huge amount of the systems dynamics that hold the earth in, uh, in the earth's biosphere into um, a set of feedback loops that keep it well-regulated and self-regulated. What we're seeing now is we're seeing that these feedback loops are beginning to become weaker. Positive feedback loops are starting to show up and we're starting to drive the, the earth's biosphere out of self-regulation. So we're seeing more, you know, obviously melting of Arctic ice, more flooding, more um, desertification. Uh, we are by many estimates in the sixth great extinction. And we're seeing this cascading set of problems with the Earth's biosphere. So when I'm looking at it and thinking about it, I really have to, I really think we have to look at this as a complete set of issues of which climate change is just really one dimension. You know, and as climate change has gotten more and more attention um, through protests, through, uh, you know, a, a lot of academic attention and so forth, a lot of proposed solutions have been have been floated. And, um, you know, I've, I've been in the engineering field now for long enough that um, when I look at a lot of these things, what really occurs to me, what it, it, first is that, that a lot of these proposed solutions, they're really coming out of somebody trying to figure out how they can monetize this whole problem. Um, there's a lot of large scale infrastructure proposals that have popped up. Things like, oh, well, let's just build a lot of huge machinery to sequester carbon out of the atmosphere. Or let's do solar geoengineering and modify the amount of incident solar radiation that can actually come down out of, you know, through the upper atmosphere and the ionosphere and hit the earth and so forth. You know, first, none of these solutions have ever been proven out at scale. Number two is they are gonna have a huge number of um, side effects that we're not gonna be able to predict ahead of time. And scaling up any of them to any meaningful level would be very expensive, uh, very extractive in terms of energy and resources and have a lot of environmentally destructive side effects. And so really none of those sorts of uh, high tech, so to speak, solutions have I looked at and, and um, thought any of them made any sense whatsoever. So when you look at it in some detail, you notice that there's a lot of key issues, including climate instability, that are being driven by disruptions to both the carbon cycle and the hydrological cycle. You know, um, there's a lot of uh, discussion in climate change has been around the fact that we have released a huge amount of carbon and greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, but a lot less has been uh, focused on the fact that we are fundamentally disrupting the hydrological cycle and the more the research is done on the impacts of um, water vapor humidity in the atmosphere, the more, the more we realize that um, the hydrological cycle is a huge uh, moderator of and transfer agent of heat in the atmosphere. And I think what we're gonna see as we go forward is that um, we're going to have to discuss the fact that the hydrological cycles have been disrupted and we're desertifying huge amounts of the terrestrial biosphere. By some accounts, we are in the middle of desertifying up to a third of the Earth's uh, land mass uh, right now through this disruption of the Earth's biosphere. And so we have to look at both the carbon cycle, how much we've been pulling carbon that's been sequestered in the forms of fossil fuels and burning them and releasing that into the atmosphere. And 
the amount of hydrological cycle disruption that we've been doing by literally cutting down the forests, uh, destroying Earth's um, great biomass reserves, uh, destroying much of our rangelands and our grasslands. And unless we, dis we discuss all of this in a single large systems scale, we can't really begin to get around uh, to finding solutions that are going to actually work at the level that's going to be required in order for us to, you know, to, to solve climate by 2030. Um, what it comes down to is we're going to need solutions that can address multiple dimensions at one time. Um, dimension, you know, things that really are only addressing, say, carbon sequestration, uh, and that's all they're looking at, they're not really going to do the trick, I don't think. Um, and so when I look at it and somebody says, hey, we're going to build this big, very expensive, multi-billion dollar machine that's going to pull carbon out of the atmosphere and try to you know, pull it down into some sort of stable chemical form that we can sequester, I go, well, that's really interesting, but does your machine also address the hydrological cycle? Does it address all of the other dimensions of ecological you know, collapse that we're in the middle of? Because what we really need is we need a machine that instead of requiring us to spend billions of dollars to build it, that instead it builds itself out of available resources on site, that it takes the energy to do so out of available solar energy, that it constructs itself and um, replicates itself, that new designs for new generations of this machine, um, they automatically adjust themselves to the environment in which they find themselves and they reproduce on their own. And we have a name for these machines, they're called trees. The, you know, there, we really are not to the point of having any human technology that is remotely as elegant as na na nature-based solutions for addressing climate change. So what you come down to is that every solution that has been proven to work at scale is a form of a nature-based solution. And the interesting thing to me about nature-based solutions is that whereas the large scale gimmicky high-tech solutions that are being sold have a tendency to enrich and empower the billionaires, the nature-based solutions have a tendency to work at community scale to be empowering at the local level, to regenerate local economies and to be able to address questions of equity and social justice as well as climate. So, you know, that to me says that there are many reasons we need to be looking at and focusing on nature-based solutions um, and not, you know, looking towards the high-tech industry and things that are, you know, going to basically make the rich even richer at the expense of communities that are already being stressed and, um, and impoverished by what we have seen of this ecological uh, set of collapsing, cascading collapses so far. You know, when I look at you know, the whole conversation and hear this, the, the questions that come up a lot. One of the things I have to come back to is the fact that humans really are a keystone species. You know, there's been a lot of discussion how, for example, the gray wolf you see here is a keystone species. And when you reintroduce the gray wolf into environments like, you know, Yellowstone National Park very famously, that trophic cascades occur and that a rebalancing of ecosystems happens and that a huge amount of ecosystem function regenerates itself. And when I see that, it occurs to me that what we've done is we've taken humans who are a keystone species and pretended that we are not a part of the, the larger environment, that we're somehow separate from and differentiated from the environment that surrounds us. 
instead of stepping up and recognizing that we are an integral part of the ecosystems in which we are embedded. And that if we step away from our responsibility as a keystone species and do not address the damage that we have done uh, through our um, project of civilization over the last 12,000 years, that it's gonna take natural processes tens of thousands of years to fix the problems that we have created. But in having worked with systems like permaculture and other systems of regenerative design, I've come to realize that if we step up and become involved, that we can oftentimes regenerate in just a few years or a few decades what really would take natural processes thousands of years to regenerate. And we're going to have to do that. So how do we, you know, what do we practically need to do? Well, we could, we could spend a lot of time going through the details, but I'm just going to offer a couple of ideas, things that really occur to me. Number one is we're going to have to move from monoculture, chemical agriculture to polyculture, biological cultivation of our foods. Um, you know, the United Nations FOA has stated from their research that it's going to be small organic farms. They're using biological cultivation of polycultures. That's going to be what's going to have to feed the, the planet going forward that really what's happening is we're destroying our topsoil all across the planet with monoculture crops on large scale using chemical agriculture. Um, the more I study it, the more I feel that there's absolutely no excuse for this kind of scene where you have to have people in hazmat suits applying the chemicals uh, to what they're now gonna tell you is the, our food, our food supply. And um, the more I have worked with, studied, and, um, and helped with the creation of regenerative agricultural systems, the more I've become convinced that this is a dead end, that it's, high, it's highly destructive, and that we're going to have to move onward into something um, that is very different. And that's going to look like polyculture and um, cultivation of, of high, high value nutrient dense crops. Second, you know, one of the things that Derek Jensen has said, a very famous quote of his, is that forests precede us and deserts dog our heels. It's the fact that if you look at the, this desertification cycle, you realize that industrial plow-based agriculture has, you know, been at the leading forefront of desertifying huge amounts of the planet. And that has been one of the, the main drivers of climate change and of um, a lot of the ecosystem collapse. So we've got to get out of that whole death spiral of modern agriculture. Um, we must regenerate the biomass of our forests, our rangelands, our grasslands, and that's really the only way we're going to rebalance the carbon and hydrological cycles and get a lot of the, the self-generating, self-regulating feedback loops in the Earth's biosphere reestablished. Um, we need to create systems that run on the real-time energy of the sun, that create closed loop nutrient cycles. Um, and in order to do that, we're gonna to have to drastically reduce our energy use. Um, we need to aim for 80% or more reduction in our base energy use. That will allow us to transition off of fossil fuels and can be done while actually increasing the quality of life for everyone. Now that takes a lot to unpack and we don't have time to address that right now, but that's something I've become increasingly convinced of as I have worked with uh, people around the world, indigenous people groups that are looking at reestablishing uh, their life ways. We have examples of doing exactly this, of drastically reducing consumption of energy and resources while at the same time dramatically increasing quality of life. So, you know, really the climate crisis is simply one symptom of the larger ecosystem collapse that we are seeing right now. And so I guess what I would say to wrap it up would be governments and corporations won't make large scale changes to address these issues unless it's demanded by a broad cross section of the population, not just a vocal few. So we need to grow the number of voices that are you know, talking about this, that are asking for these changes 
And really what I would say is you, your way of helping if you want to become involved is first reduce your personal consumption. Uh, look at ways that you can begin to address it at that level because that sets an example and shows what can be done. Secondly, you know, take and vote with the way you spend your money, demand products and services that are regenerative. Um, look, look for and spend your money with those companies that are really helping to address these issues. And third, you know, help by putting consistent pressure backed by well-articulated reasoning on your local, state, and national governments. And you know, the, those, I think, are some of the most practical, immediate things we can be doing. I know Daniel's going to be you know, talking next specifically about um, reducing that energy demand and how we can do that. And I think that's really is, you know, I'll hand it off to Daniel here in a minute as he begins to help us think about what we can do here in our state to begin to put that exact kind of pressure onto our, um, you know, onto our regulators and, and get things moving forward in that way. So that's, uh, with that, I'll hand it back over to Mike. Thank you very much, Alan. All right, Daniel. Daniel's gonna to talk to us about climate solutions and specifically, as Alan said, as they relate to energy. Yeah, for sure. Well, I appreciate everybody uh, joining us this evening and, and thanks Alan for the nice softball there. I really do appreciate that. Uh, as everybody you know, mentioned before, I'm Daniel Tate with Energy Alabama and uh, we work to accelerate the transition here to sustainable energy in, in the state. I wanted to you know, first preface you know, the point that Mike just made and you saw that through Alan's presentation that everything I'm talking about, at least from our perspective as an organization, I'm just an energy nerd. So I know a lot of things about kilowatt hours and therms and all that kind of good stuff. And it's an extremely important part of the larger question that we had to solve, right? But as again, as you saw from Alan's presentation, it's only one. Uh, we can do a lot of things in the energy space that have multiple benefits, as he spoke about, that help people, uh, as well as it you know, helps to solve an ecological crisis at the same time. But there are lots of other things even outside of the quote unquote energy world that need to need to happen. So I wanted to hit on just a few things that Alan mentioned that were really uh, powerful, I felt like to me, that relate a lot to the to the world of energy and how we consume it, what we what we do with it here and how it can affect change here in the state of Alabama. Uh, he said a few things, and I'm just going to rattle a couple of them off because I, I was making notes as, as you were talking there, Alan, about, you know, we have over the probably, you know, many hundreds of years, maybe since the Industrial Revolution, been on this quest of uh, something that we heard in the Lorax, right? Biggering and biggering and biggering. And a lot of the solutions that we're talking about uh, in, in the energy world, and you see this too in other technologies, right? We, where we spent hundreds of years making things bigger and bigger them. And now we're looking at ways that we make networks more distributed uh, when you have things like the internet or you have things like cellular technology that we're all carrying around. And now in the energy world where it used to be that everything had to be central power plant stations uh, and we were gonna make a bunch of energy and ship it hundreds of miles to the location where everybody was consuming it. And it does not necessarily have to be that way anymore. We can have more distributed, more community scale benefits. And so the reason that I bring all this up is to say that our energy system is, is very, you know, when we think about electricity and gas and the things that people consume in their homes and businesses is very much in this structure, right? That over many decades, if not hundreds of years, we have created a system where a few corporations, uh, and in some cases, uh, I would call them, you know, some some of our utilities are agents of the government, right? They are municipal utilities or they are part of the federal government. So it's not always a private corporation, but we have created these massive behemoths uh, that are designed uh, to provide these services to us. And what we really have to do, right, is begin the process uh, of introducing and relying on community-based solutions, distributed scale solutions, that really put the power, pardon the pun, or maybe pun intended, I should say, more so than pardon the pun, 
uh, back into the hands of the people, right? Rather than just a small set of corporations or government agencies that are making the decisions that affect millions and millions of us, but how can we actually get those benefits back to the people? And so uh, you'll notice as I talk a little bit about things like energy efficiency and renewables, that the voices that are you know, taxing solar power in the state of Alabama who are refusing to invest in energy efficiency because they want you to buy more of their product, they are a product of that system, right? Where they need you reliant on the biggering and biggering of their system. And in order for us to truly solve this problem, uh, at least from an energy perspective, we've got to kind of break that cycle. An another thing that Alan mentioned was around the nature-based solutions. So obviously I'm going to talk a lot about solar and wind and things like that, but a uh, really cool thing about renewable energy that I want to mention, you know, is not only does it have like the multiple benefits of bringing that back down to the community scale where we can do things literally on homes and businesses, business level or uh, down to the community level, uh, which is just fantastic. Uh, but he said, I think I wrote it down, that run on the cycle of the sun, right? And so there's a lot of things that run on the cycle of the sun. And, and we can also design our systems to run on the cycle of the sun. Something that is a very crude example of that is what's happening in, in California, where you actually are starting to see so much solar power on the grid at once that it's driving power prices in the middle of the day negative, where there's actually an oversupply of solar power during the day, where effectively it's free energy. So then if you have free energy during the middle of the day, what can you do with that that you otherwise would have done at some other time? How do we redesign our systems to take advantage of that? So if we're moving to electric transportation instead of burning, say, gas and diesel, but actually using clean electricity in our cars and the way that we move around and say public transportation, wouldn't it be great to charge those during the middle of the day when we have an overabundance of supply of, of renewable energy? Of course, right? So we start to rethink literally down to the day by day level of when are we doing things uh, that are putting us as a species, us as a society, our communities on the cycle of the sun. So uh, in terms of climate solutions around energy specifically, I mean, I think most people will know, right, that as Alan said, there's two main main ways, right? Is one is energy conservation and efficiency, which are oftentimes lumped together, but they are different, right? Conservation is let's stop wasting energy. That's what our moms and dads used to yell at us when they said, turn that light off when you run out the door, or I can't believe you left the door open you know, where you're born in a barn. You know, I had my parents yell that at me. So that's what they're getting at, conservation. Why are you wasting something that you're not even using? Uh, we can do a phenomenal job at reducing consumption uh, that we have failed to do, at least heretofore. Uh, second is the energy efficiency piece, which is, okay, modern lifestyle requires us to have the use of energy for certain things that we want to do. And when we're going to do those things, right, can we use as little as energy as possible to give us the benefits that we want? That's what we mean when we say uh, energy efficiency. And then, of course, the the big bucket that most people think about is renewable energy. So wind and solar and storage technologies. Again, a lot of really cool storage technologies that are being developed uh, are you know, more nature-based solutions where something as simple as pumping water or pumping air back and forth during different times of the day or different times of the year so that you're not, you're not even really using materials per se. You're just using the you know, uh, items around you in nature uh, over and over and over again. Uh, so those are kind of the two big things. Like, and specifically to, to Alabama, it will be no shock to anyone on this call or probably any resident of the state of Alabama that uh, we are either last or next to last in almost everything. You know? And so and I tell everybody, hey, energy is no different. We're used to saying, thank God for Mississippi. And in many cases, we can't even say that. Uh, so when it comes to energy efficiency, uh, we are, you know, 50th in the nation in energy efficiency. We have some of the highest energy burdens. Uh, when we say energy burden, what we're getting at there is the amount of people's incomes that are actually having to be spent on energy as a proportion of their total income. Uh, so we have really high burdens where people are spending a ton of money on energy and not able to have enough uh, left over to make other important investments in their lives, whether that be like education or uh, healthcare, or other items that uh, everybody 
uh, should have access to. And so then you also have on the renewable energy side, you know, uh, I'll put a plug out for Nina's organization, Gas, which has been, you know, excellent at really taking the fight to Alabama Power, to Alabama Public Service Commission about uh, the tax that's on solar. So, you know, again, they need you to bigger and bigger their system. But when you try to, you know, put solar on your home or in your community, there's a tax uh, that stops you from being able to do that throughout much of the state of Alabama. And so organizations like GAS have been fighting hard to get that over overturned and have just a couple of days ago, I believe, or here pretty recently, uh, filed a complaint with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission trying to overturn that uh, because, you know, we believe that's an illegal, uh, uh, an illegal action by the power company and, and by the Public Service Commission. And so these are really important when you look at how far behind we are in Alabama on energy efficiency, things we can do in homes and businesses and renewable energy, we have a long way to go. I kind of briefly mentioned earlier about electric transportation. The reason that I bring it up is because number one is sexy. A lot of people like it. And you heard, if you were here earlier, you heard Mike and I talking about electric vehicle rallies and people are interested in this kind of stuff. And it's just a, a really cool, fun way to get people engaged and, and get more people talking about sustainable solutions. But ultimately electric transportation is more an issue of one and two, the energy efficiency and the renewable energy, right? So if we're doing electric transportation right, the, the EV itself actually is a highly efficient version, right, of an ICE vehicle, an internal combustion engine vehicle, where, you know, the, the engine is pushing, say, more 90% efficient as opposed to more like 15 or 20% in terms of the energy going in, what is actually moving rubber down the road, right? EVs are much more efficient. And on top of that, we can power them with renewables if we're designing those systems right. So electric transportation is extremely important, uh, but I view them more as a challenge of efficiency and renewables because we've got to solve those two problems so that as we deploy more electric vehicles, they're clean. They're the only vehicles that get cleaner over time. If you buy an electric vehicle today, um, and if we're all doing our jobs right, acting collectively uh, to make the grid and everything cleaner, you actually will have less impact when you drive that vehicle five years from now than you do today based on the you know, nature of the electricity that you're using. Um, so in terms of like how to go about these solutions, and I'll wrap it up and kind of hand over to Nina, is you know, much like Alan said, there are of course things that you personally can do, but I view this much more as a structural issue where it's gonna take all of us uh, figuring out what we can do at the local state and even federal level. So I think one thing that I wanna make sure that everybody thinks hard about and tries to find the information if you don't already have it is who are your electric providers? Who are your gas providers if you have them and potentially getting away from gas altogether? Uh, and electrifying your home. But a lot of people don't necessarily either know or understand the governance structures of the utilities they have. So here in Alabama, we have you know, municipal utilities. That's action that you can take uh, directly with a local city council probably, and you can make pretty good progress much faster, right? Than having to say pass federal legislation to fix a federal utility. Uh, and then also we have uh, investor owned utilities that are regulated by the Public Service Commission, a three member elected board, uh, elected service commission, public service commission. So you got to think about, OK, who are my providers of my essential utility services and how can I make change? Like, what are my levers, if you will, to uh, vote or to have my voice heard, maybe even run for office of uh, electric cooperative and get on the board of directors and help make change. There's all these different ways you can do that. So if I have to give you a piece of homework, it's go find out who your providers are, how's their governance, how are they structured and figure out where can you plug in in that governance structure to actually make your voice heard. Uh, and then lastly, and probably even more importantly, because and these groups will help you do that is go find an organization, whether that be GASP, I had to give a plug, of course, for Energy Alabama, but any organization in the state of Alabama that is helping on any of these issues, even if you're passionate about something that's not necessarily energy, 
go find great organizations that are on the ground doing this type of work, get involved, volunteer, give money if you have it. But these organizations will help equip you with the resources and know-how to make the change that we need at a structural level. And uh, that's enough of Daniel preaching for, for, for at least this section. So I appreciate y'all's patience with me and I'm gonna hand it off to back to Mike and then on to Nina. Well, I will um, jump in right now. Um, hard to go behind uh, you, Daniel and and um, and Alan, but I'll I'll do my best. Um, and yeah, so my name is Nina Morgan. Um, I I'm a climate and environmental justice organizer for GASP. Um, been with the organization for almost two years now. Um, Alabama native, born and raised in a small town called Sipsy, Alabama. It's a mining town. Um, it's less than a mile away from the McWayne uh, Burton mine. Um, and so, yeah, my personal experience um, is one of um, very close proximity to um, industry and, and um, just, you know, uh, experiencing how uh, living really close to um, extractive industry affects community, affects um, people in my own family, myself and, and our neighbors. Um, so that's kind of um, my background and, I, and I, I'm really thankful to just, you know, get to be a part of this conversation. So what I'm gonna do really quick is I'm going to share my screen, um, these slides here. Okay, can y'all see my screen? Okay, awesome. And I'll hit present mode. Okay, so um, so yeah, Alan and uh, Daniel really uh, covered a lot of the this this um, last presentation and conversation that I wanted to give today on just transition, and um, and yeah, just transition basically is about um, transitioning away from extraction, transitioning away from um, all the negative things that have been talked about this evening, um, you know, uh, fossil fuels and how um, it negatively impacts us and our, our planet um, and transitioning to, to, to a, a regenerative economy, one that um, meets the needs of uh, people while, while really uh, stewarding our planet and, and taking care of our planet and not destroying um, the natural systems that we all depend on to live. Um, that, that's basically what, what Just Transition um, in a nutshell is all about. Um, and so, yeah, that's a little bit about what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna cover today. Um, so just to get us started, and I really like these images because to me they kind of communicate um, both like the boldness of wanting and demanding something new um, for our for ourselves and for our planet, and um, also kind of the drudgery of our, our current economy. Um, so so transitioning away from an extractive economy, and if you you all give me just a second. I um, have some notes that I wanted to kind of read off of and um, my internet is being a little bit tricky and I wonder if I can uh, hmm, go into a presenter mode on this. Hmm. I'm not sure how this looks on the screen. Um, hmm, okay, maybe not. Um, give me one second. Y'all, sorry. I had some, some, some thoughts that I uh, typed out and um, I'm having trouble pulling them up. Um, hmm. Hmm. Well, let's do this. I'm gonna, I don't know if y'all can see my, can y'all see my slide still? If I do it this way, awesome, okay. Um, okay, great. So transitioning away from an extractive economy. So right now, um, what you're looking at are images um, 
of of Alabama, um, of different scenes in Alabama, based on the work that I do as a as an organizer with GASP, um, and also just some scenes that have affected my own community in Sipsi. Um, and so I want to say, first of all, what we mean by an extractive economy is that um, kind of like what Alan and Daniel um, were talking about, our whole economy is literally extractive in the, in the sense that um, we dig up our, we dig up things from the earth, resources from the earth, um, oil, gas from the ground, and, and um, cut down forests, disrupt water cycles and other earth systems. And, um, and, and, and really create a pipeline of destruction um, and exploitation of, of people in our planet and one that leads to um, a lot of pollution and contamination. And so our economy right now basically says that, um, you know, the labor um, and work of people and um, our basic humanity and land and water and soil and air and all of the resources that um, are extracted have a price. That's, that's what people mean when they talk about the extractive economy and extractive industries. And um, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, that's, that's what I, um, I interact with, you know, in, in real time every day. I am um, in communities, coined environmental justice communities that um, are, are bearing the brunt um, and the externalities of um, industries that um, exploit and pollute. And so um, these pictures are really just, uh, just uh, images of, of what I see and and what people are uh, living with on a day to day basis, and I'm sure that you know uh, folks on this call um, are well aware of the the challenges um, that communities all across the state of Alabama are facing. You know, um, I work particularly in the North Birmingham community, um, in the three neighborhoods that make up the 35th Avenue Superfund site in North Birmingham, and um, work really closely with Mr. Charlie Powell who is the, um, the, the president and founder of a grassroots organization called PANIC. It stands for People Against Neighborhood Industrial Contamination. And you know, I, um, we meet every Monday and every Monday he says he, he talks about a funeral that he's been to. Um, you know, where people are dying of strokes, where people are dying of heart attacks, um, asthma attacks, uh, COVID, and we know that environmental justice communities that are facing a lot of the brunt of extractive industry are also more vulnerable um, to dying from coronavirus. And so, um, you know, when we have heavy rains, like we had, um, you know, just uh, in the past couple of weeks, there's people who literally um, cannot leave their, 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 their yards without having to trudge through water um, and, and sewage back up. Um, I, like I said, I lived in Sipsi and, um, you know, in 29, I think the, 20, the spring of 2019, um, the rendering, the Tyson rendering facility um, had a spill and there was a, a huge die off of hundreds of thousands of fish on the Mulberry Fork, which is a tributary into the Black Warrior River. And, um, you know, I grew up swimming and eating fish out of that, out of, out of the Mulberry Fork and my, my uncle's fish there. And so I'm coming from a place of seeing um, the ways that uh, the extractive economy and the extractive industry actually plays out and manifests itself in real life. And um, I hear stories all the time of people who are dealing with the outpour of that. Um, folks living right across the street from um, coke plants, from coal mines, from um, you know, uh, landfills and, 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 and quarries and all sorts of things. And so um, this, is, this is a very real challenge and struggle that, that people are dealing with and living with. Um, and so we're, we wanna move away from that. We, we wanna move away from that. Um, and, and really like Alan and um, Daniel um, were saying, transform uh, into a regenerative economy, transform our current extractive economy into one that's regenerative and one that takes care of people and planet. And um, yeah, and I, I kind of like thinking about just transition in, within the context of transformation. Tr uh, just transition is, um, it speaks to 
a set of um, ideological principles and processes and, um, and, and practices and kind of outlines uh, you know, what, like how we, uh, how we transform, but ultimately what we're doing is talking about a transformation of our society um, into something else, something different, something new. Um, and it's really beautiful to think about and challenging and inspiring and all the things. Um, and there's not a, it, there's not a one size fit fits all approach is that's kind of what I am taking away from um, the, our previous panel is that there's not a one size fit, fits all approach and that we really can look to nature in terms of developing solutions to get us out of the climate crisis um, before it's too late. And so what I want to say here is that, um, yeah, sometimes our imaginations can be a little bit limited um, because we've been living in an extractive economy I mean, speaking for myself, I, that's all I've ever known. That's all most people, all, all everybody on this call has, has ever known um, in some way, shape or form, um, you know, for centuries. And so for, for years and years. And so, um, you know, it, the extractive economy and society and the culture that it has produced has been normalized um, for a really long time. And so, uh, you know, it's 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 kind of um, it can be challenging to think about what like a vision for a new world looks like, but um, blueprints already exist uh, from 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 the smallest behaviors to the to the largest visions of a new world, right? Um, and and I and and um, and basically, yeah, regenerative economy is about, uh, it's the opposite of extractive economy and, and, it, and, it, and, it, uh, and it meets everybody's needs. So, you know, what is, what, what is a regenerative like water system? What is a regenerative um, housing structure? What is re a regenerative economy when it comes to thinking through how to um, basically take a lot of these industrialized uh, sites that are in residential areas um, and turning them into something else? Um, one thing that we, that's one thing that we're thinking about with gas, which we shouldn't have to, you know, people in power and decision makers and politicians, they should, they represent us. Um, and they should be the ones, you know, kind of working with different agencies and organizations thinking through these things. But um, alas, at least in Alabama, you, you often have under-resourced, um, at capacity, small organizations that are actually thinking through a lot of these big, big problems um, and trying to come up with solutions. And so I wanna say that, um, you know, just from my own experience, a lot of these pictures are of work that um, I have been involved in and people, um, you know, right now are thinking through. You have um, Majadi Baruti and Susan Diane Mitchell with the Smithfield Dynamite Hill Community Land Trust in Birmingham that have a whole blueprint for thinking through how to um, use all of the vacant land in Birmingham and really building a community scale urban agriculture operation that meets the needs of all Birmingham residents. You have people who are thinking of rethinking housing um, and how to make it affordable and also quality housing um, in a cooperative model. You have people who are um, talking through visions for the whole region, which is why I have a Gulf South for a Green New Deal uh, icon on the, on the slide because, um, which is something that GASP and I believe Energy Alabama in some, in some capacity are part of, Really rethinking. Okay, um, what is this? What is what is uh, a re building a regenerative economy and 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 trying to kickstart a just transition mean for the South, right? Because we know that the South historically, um, you know, just like people, you know, ha always, you know. Uh, frame Alabama negatively. People think about the South and, and there's a lot of negative connotations when, when people uh, talk about the South. And so how, um, how can we combat that and actually come together as Southerners and think about what just transition and building a, regen a regenerative economy mean 
for um, our region, which is what the Gulf South for a Green New Deal is all about. It's a vision for just that. Um, I'm a part of the Birmingham Earth Coalition, whose vision is to um, is, is to really build a climate and environmental justice movement across the state of Alabama by centering justice, um, by centering justice, racial, economic, um, you know, you name it. And um, something else, I guess my last thing that I want to say here is that, you know, in Alabama, um, people might not uh, be out, I guess, about climate change and, um, and, and talk about it in ways that like, you know, we, we do here in this space, uh, the panelists have, but people in Alabama, um, you know, I think intuitively understand, first of all, that the climate is changing, something about our natural systems have shifted. Um, and, and also people, a lot of times, especially elders and boomers, ha already have like um, certain behaviors that, um, that are kind of uh, uh, sustainable. Like, for example, um, I uh, have a lot of conversations with a lot of boomers and, and, and elders in North Birmingham. And what I see a lot of the times is, um, uh, you know, this resistance to a culture of scarcity where things are wasted, where we just throw away um, food and, 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 and um, just whatever the things we deem as being wasteful. A lot of the times I see uh, people saving, you know, scraps of wood and paper and cans and like using it to build something, you know, using it on their homes, using it, um, you know, for for whatever activities they like to engage in down the line. Um, you know, I see people all the time going to dumps and stuff and like picking up scrap metal to use for whatever. And so our folks know in Alabama um, at some level that sustainability and like the, the, the principles of reuse, reduce, recycle, right? Um, our folks already know about that. You know, they might, people might not um, express it in the ways that like us, regenerative economy nerds express it, but I do think that there is uh, some ethic of sustainability and of stewardship in our state. And so I think it's up to us as people who want to build a movement for a just transition or a just transformation to speak to that, to speak people's language, meet folks where they're at in order to, 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 to move into something else and to really kind of nudge our people into the, the direction that we know we need to go into. Um, and I guess my my last slide, um, you know, if you don't take anything away from my presentation, and I'm sorry for the pause at the very beginning, but if you don't take anything away else away from what I'm trying to say, um, please remember one that that we're we're talking about a transformation, right? We're living in a very historic time. Something that me and my I have a twin brother, and something that we always talk about is like, what would you do if you were living in the civil rights movement, or what would you do if blah blah blah? Uh, you know, like we're here. You know, um, we're we're living in a very historical time, not just because of COVID, but because of the um, we, there's like a nexus that we're at, where a lot of different things are happening at one time. Where you know, Alan talked about uh, the uproar and and um, movement for racial justice. You know, um, we, we've seen historic wildfires, historic droughts, historic floods, you know, um, and so we shouldn't take lightly the time that we're living in. Um, one question that a really uh, amazing facilitator from the Highlander Research and Education Center always says is like, um, what time is it in the world? And I think that that's something that we need to be asking ourselves right now. Um, 10 years to solve the climate crisis is not something that we should be taking lightly. Um, so yeah, and, and I also would like to say that, you know, we have, the, the solutions are already there. Um, it's not, we're not dealing with the issue of the lack of there being solutions. We're dealing with, um, we're dealing with a time where there's a lack of political will. And so it is important to build movements. It is important to, to, to articulate clearly our visions um, for, for where we need to go and why we need to go there. It is, um, it, it, and, 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 you know, I have a picture on this slide of, um, the climate strikes, I believe in 2018, 
I could have those dates wrong, but a lot of young people in Alabama already are pushing for a change to happen. This is a really great picture of the um, climate strikes. Um, and when, when a lot of young people in the state of Alabama came out to demand that we protect our planet and what you're gonna be seeing in the, in the coming months in April and May is um, really an upswell of movement happening where um, people from all different walks of life across this, the, the United States and in the South are gonna be demanding for um, a change, de demanding for justice, demanding for a, a just transition. And so I would invite everybody, if you're not um, connected to movement, connect to movement, connect with Energy Alabama, connect with GASP, follow up after this call um, and try to get plugged in. I like uh, the philosophy of starting locally and th but thinking globally. And I'm gonna land the plane because I know I'm running out of time. But, um, but yeah, please, please do that. And um, my, I guess my last thing uh, in terms of uh, ways to plug in and, and how to take action is um, to be proximate to communities that are um, really uh, contributing oftentimes the least to climate change, but burdened with uh, the most negative impacts of the, the extractive economy. Um, you know, volunteer, um, commit to community service, come visit, you know, folks in North Birmingham, um, drive to a lot of these industrial sites, drive to, to Miller Steam, which is the largest contributor of greenhouse gas in the in the country, which is in Alabama, it's in, it's in West Jefferson County. Drive up there, see for see for yourself, and look at the communities that these industrial sites are situated in, and um, and and meet people where they're at, and 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 contribute acts of service to these um, oftentimes fence line communities. Um, so so yeah, uh, that's that's all I have for you all today, and and thank you so much for allowing me to um, to speak. Thank you so much, Nina. And I love the way you summed it up, uh, really echoing what everybody said is, it's gonna take all of us. If there's one common theme from what Alan and Daniel and Nina said is that we have to get involved. Um, really, we're, we're citizens in a democracy and we really can create the change we want if we engage with others and take action on the great ideas that are out there. Nina also said there's nothing we need to know that we don't already know. And Alan and Daniel both talked about that a little bit to solve all these problems and in the process, create a transformational world for us all to live in. So um, let's take a look at the questions and uh, we will answer them in the order that they've been voted up. And the first question is from David Knowles and this is to you, Daniel. What role will or can distributive generation of power have in solving some of the issues we're facing today? In your opinion, is it a local energy solution that will help communities in the way that Alan says is necessary and Nina says is necessary for creating lasting change rather than a payday for someone? Yeah, it's a, it's a massive, massive part. I mean, so it's, you have to think of, the way I think about it is you have like a, a technology issue right where you're tr you're trying to get the renewables the distribution of power down to a, a local level down to a community level down to even maybe an individual house level that's one thing and then you're also trying to uh, think about where those benefits flow so if you think about um utility companies that charge solar taxes like Alabama power they would tell you hey we're not anti-renewable energy and there's probably some truth to that, right? Like they'll build renewable energy as long as they can make tons and tons of money off of it, uh, as long as you remain captive to them, right? So there is an issue there about where do the benefits flow and that you could, in theory, uh, do a lot of the things that I talk about in renewable energy and do them in a way that actually either exacerbates or kind of further cements the systems that we're trying to change, right? So you can do them poorly. Um, let me give you a couple of examples of how you can do them positively and do them the right way. Uh, I, this is an article that I share and happy to try to make, get a copy of it to anyone who wants it on this call, but I love it. It's about uh, a policy that we're trying to change here in Alabama called third party ownership. That's really about 
how do we open up access to renewable energy to more people rather than uh, just the folks who have the upfront cash, the tens of thousands of dollars to do it. So they passed a policy like this in Arkansas and a school district uh, put solar on a lot of different schools all around their district. And they saved a ton of money in the process. What did they do with that money? They gave all the teachers in the district a $15,000 a year raise. Okay. So it's also not just thinking about like the word payday is not a bad thing in my opinion, like, but who's getting the payday? Like, are we, are we extracting for the benefit of Alabama power for an investor owned utility for in investors on wall street? Or are we, are we getting a payday and helping put more of that benefit into the hands of people in our communities, or in that case, directly into the hands of teachers, right? That is phenomenal work that they did in that school district in, in Arkansas. And another example I'll give you is around, you know, Habitat for Humanity. Uh, if you are trying to work with folks to get them on their feet and, and into home ownership and uh, being able to build generational wealth through that um, and making sure that these homes are actually not just livable, but are actually something that's going to build wealth. Well, those folks need to be able to afford the utility bill. It's not just enough to put somebody in a home and then all of a sudden the operational costs of keeping that home running are unaffordable. And that's why you see more and more Habitat for Humanity uh, affiliates and also people who are working in affordable housing, thinking hard about how do we make sure these homes uh, are as efficient as possible and introducing renewables where possible so that the benefits of say a habitat home are actually accruing directly to the resident, the person who owns it, as opposed to putting someone in a home and continuing to extract out of that home, out of that family for someone else. Those are perfect examples in, in my head of, of how we do exactly that. Thank you, Daniel. Alan or Nina, do you have anything to, you'd like to add to that? I just say that um, we're to the point now where if we do it properly, the, that there's no need for any of these Habitat for Humanity homes to actually um, have a, a power bill. Um, they should actually be generating um, you know, more power than they use. It's, we, we now have the technology to do that. So um, only other thing I would say is that you have to understand that when you look at the energy use intensity of, of a building, there's two different ways of looking at that number. One is the amount you consume on site. And then there's another one, which is called the source energy use intensity. And when you look at the two numbers are drastically different. What you're seeing is that when you look at the amount of energy that's required to be produced at a remote site in order to go through all the inefficiencies of getting it to you, then you'll notice that oftentimes it takes twice or more of the energy being produced remotely than it does to be produced locally. So there's a huge amount of inefficiencies in this large scale, besides just the monetary inefficiencies of building huge power infrastructure and the efficiencies accrue to small uh, solutions distributed. And sorry, one more point. To Alan's point, in Alabama, it's worse. It's three. So for every one kilowatt hour you use in your home, the power company has to generate 3.1 on average just to make sure you get one in your home. Think about all the all the impacts that come with that. Yeah. So design the house to use 80% less, and then it's actually much less expensive to have to put the, the power generation on the building. And now, now you're going in the right direction. Thank you, Alan. Nina, here's a question for you. If Alabama substantially boosts its renewable energy production, to what extent would that affect the job market? How does that open up jobs? How and where do individuals get trained to work in solar or wind? Does anyone know any training opportunities here in Alabama? Well, I'm not an energy expert, but I would say that it would, it would um, I mean, transform the job market in Alabama. We're all, we are already seeing the rollout of um, electric car manufacturing in the state. So what would that look like if, this, if the energy source powering a lot of these EV cars um, and EV infrastructure is coming from solar, you know, um, what, what would, how, what, what, what would that do to our um, job market and our economy in the state? I tend to think that it would, it would help um, the economy in Alabama and, and see something to think about too, is that 
um, in terms of jobs, now, you know, but Daniel, correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I'm reading, um, jobs in coal, um, you know, or jobs in jobs in, in solar have surpassed jobs in coal anyway, right? And that happened like what a year, two years ago. So, so I, I think that you know. Um, if, if we did have more of a solar um, market in the state and we had more jobs, then I mean that that would that would help our, our job market. You know, I don't know um, the labor participation rates in Alabama, maybe somebody else does, but I know that the labor participation rates for the country is at, at about 60%. So that means of out of all the people who can work, um, only 60% are, are participating. So when you think about that, that information and that statistic, you know, it, I think it, um, it, it invites us to think, of, to think about work and to think about jobs and, and, and the future and, and what that means. Um, is it necessary? I mean, if, you know, if, if, Tech, with if technology advances to the point um, where a lot of things are automated, which they're already starting to to, to be, um, what does that mean for jobs? What does that mean for uh, work in in our country and around the world? Um, yeah, so that's kind of that would be my answer um, to that. I know that we have uh, Vulcan and Eagle Solar um, as two companies in Alabama that are that are really moving on solar. And trying to um, trying to 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 open up the market here. Um, I don't know of any job training programs off the top of my head, so I'd be curious if um, Daniel, you, or or Alan know about uh, any opportunities. The, I have a I have a ton to say on this on this particular question, but I'm going to keep it very very brief uh, because I've I've been. Uh, pulling a utility and monopolizing some time here. So my apologies for that. But um, yes, yeah, so in the in the 2009 stimulus back, uh, you know, a little over a decade ago, the federal government spent a lot of money through the Department of Labor with uh, opening up training programs at a variety of technical and community colleges, of which many of them, there are at least a handful here in the state of Alabama that do have at least curriculum on hand that they can do uh, some energy efficiency and renewable energy training. One of the most well-known was one in uh, at Calhoun uh, Community College, just north of Decatur, kind of in between Decatur and, and uh, Huntsville. But there were some throughout the state. So this stuff exists. Uh, we have a kind of a chicken and egg problem where we had a lot of people that went to that Calhoun program uh, that we worked with that couldn't find work in Alabama because all the jobs that uh, Nina was just talking about, there's tons of them out there, but they had to go move to another state uh, to go find them. So we are literally training our young folks here in the state and then sending them away because they're able to find good paying jobs for themselves and their families somewhere else. So we, you know, we, we have this stuff, we've got to do a better job out of it, of it. And I'll just throw out a, a name for people to take a look at a, a company called Grid Alternatives that's done a really good job kind of nationally in areas where solar has been hot uh, at really reaching uh, new folks who are, have not traditionally been part of the labor pool like Nina was getting at uh, and, and helping to, to break a, a generational cycle of poverty through renewable energy. So that's, you know, really cool uh, business model they have actually at a nonprofit, I'm pretty sure. So, you know, give them a give them a look as well. Great. Yeah, and I really want to lift up the like brain drain, the fact that that uh, people being trained on some of this stuff are leaving the state. Um, I participated in the in building the UA, the UAB solar home, um, which is now a demonstration site um, on campus. But we participated in the Department of Energy Solar Decathlon competition, I believe, in 2018. Um, and and a lot of the the engineering students in particular that that worked on the house and and, and um, helped install the solar panels and think through the design and engage in the competition now live in other states because there's just there just weren't enough opportunities in Alabama. So I mean Daniel's right for sure. Yeah, let me just let me just you know call it. I like I'll point the finger. Uh, the regulatory capture with the Public Service Commission here in Alabama. They're in the back pocket of Alabama Power. Alabama Power has basically had the, had the Public Service Commission approve them penalizing 
the use of solar throughout uh, their whole service area. So a lot of the reason for this is that um, Alabama Power is protecting their monopoly and that they've used regulatory capture to do so. Um, TVA is not as bad. They're actually trying to do some good things to some degree, but in many parts of the state, Alabama Power has put a big quash on um, the rollout of solar. Thank you. Uh, here's a good follow-up question from Casey Calloway. And by the way, Casey, congratulations on your new position. I know you will be missed and welcomed at the same time. She asks, is there a way for major businesses, industry, power users, and or cities to invest in solar to push Alabama power to change? What kind of business energy usage would it take? So how can these big companies and municipalities help force that change? Yeah, this is where uh, I'll take I'll take a first stab at it. I'm sorry. Just um, this is something that you can do. Like when when Alan's talking about voting with your money, right? Uh, to the extent that Alabama Power has moved, it's been because of this. It's been because Google and Walmart basically told them you're going to do this, uh, or we're going to do it without you. And we don't. We know we're big enough that we don't need you. We can figure out ways to make this happen. So. There are ways you can vote with your money. There's also ways that, you know, I know Nina and Gas have done a lot with the, you know, trying to get the city of Birmingham to actually live up to its 100% uh, clean energy goal. Uh, they've actually got to, you know, grow some spine and stand up to Alabama Power and say, listen, our residents are, are using and spending too much. You muted yourself there, Daniel. Are you back? I die. All right. Am I there? All right. Sorry. I don't know where I cut off. My uh, headphones died on me. But um, anyways, I was just saying, you know, local governments, big companies, uh, they are the ones that have a lot of purchasing power that can affect, uh, affect change. And so you can vote with your money. Uh, you can uh, you can also go directly to like the cities of Birmingham, Auburn, Tuscaloosa. They they use a lot of power. So the so the school districts, uh, folks like Auburn, folks like the University of Alabama, they they are the ones that really can say, hey, I spend millions and millions of dollars uh, with this company every year. Let's make the change. Alan, Nina, any comments? Okay. There's a question asked earlier that uh, got an answer, but there were enough people who, uh, who who liked that question. I'm gonna ask it again and then maybe offer a couple thoughts myself right off the bat. And it's about, can we talk about human population in this discussion? And we'll post again um, a webinar actually we're, we're hosting next Tuesday, uh, the 13th at five o'clock by the Population Connection, talking about family planning and climate change. When it comes to population, there are lots of uh, opinions about how many people the Earth can sustain. I've seen some experts say four or five billion people. It took until the year 1800 for human population to reach one billion on this planet after being around for a couple hundred thousand years. It took 130 years to go to two billion, 30 years to go to three, and this last billion was added in about 10 years. And so we've gone from one billion to 8 billion in 220 years. And there is an upper limit. A physicist at the University of Colorado back in the early 2000s wanted to know what it would look like. And at the time, the human population growth rate was 1.3%. It's, I don't know what it is right now, but last time I looked, it was about 0.9%. But at a 1.3% growth rate, he calculated that in 780 years, there'd be one person per square meter of dry land on the planet. So human population growth will stop at some time. There's no question there's a connection between the two. It comes down to carrying capacity. How many resources do we have? How many people use them? And how much does each person use? And of course, that's not evenly distributed around the world because in the developed world, the United States, Europe, Australia, Japan, and so on, we consume way more than our fair share of the Earth's resources. And in that extractive economy that Nina was talking about and that Ellen was talking about, kind of a take, make waste, 
we think of the earth as an infinite source for resources and an infinite sink for our waste. It's foundationally and fundamentally unsustainable. So human population limits are tied to the way that we use resources and the amount of waste we generate and that we move, as Alan explained so well, away from, and, and Nina, away from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy, to an economy that mimics nature, uses nature's approach. So there's absolutely a connection to the number of people and the way we live on this planet. That's my view of this. Any other thoughts on this subject? That's a, that's a big one to unpack. I'll just make one statement because this is usually something that we cover in teaching permaculture and, and it takes a while to, to get into. I'll just say this, the number one thing that has proven to be the key to population stability is to improve the education and the economic well-being of women. Um, when you do that, then your, your ability to basically get population stability is drastically increased. So when we see areas in which this is a problem, the first thing we need to do is we need to make certain that we look at that, that we look at the people who have been marginalized, um, and we look at how we can take um, the people who have been pushed into that position, um, because they've often almost always been pushed there, and we uh, basically reestablished their food sovereignty, their food security, their energy sovereignty, their en energy security, and, uh, and see to the well-being of those people, in which case uh, this issue becomes much easier to address. And uh, just what Alan's referring to, I think this is where you got this, Alan, is from Project Drawdown that assessed the top 100 ways to solve climate. And when you combine family planning with educating women and girls, it is the number one solution to solving climate change. And the researchers who did crunch those numbers and looked at all the solutions, they didn't know what the number one solution was going to be, but they didn't know it was going to be that. So talk about a high leverage thing to do. It, that is it. Yeah, and let, let's clarify here. We're not talking about educating women in family planning. No, that's... It's, it's two different things. Two They're, different it, things. We're talking here increasing the welfare of women across the board, their access to education broadly. Correct. And it just to, yeah, the way Project Drawdown defined it was educating women and children and as part of that family planning was together the number one solution, right? It's empowering women to be economically autonomous, politically autonomous, be educated. Yeah, right. Nina? I also want to hop in here and, and say um, that uh, something that this question makes me think about is, um, you know, com compare comparisons when, when um, in terms of consumption. I um, have, have read several times from several different, different places that the United States um, has astronomical consumption and in, in waste rates. I mean, we consume like what, like the amount of several herbs. I know some one of y'all know this, the stat on that, but um, we consume a lot and, and we waste a lot. So when we think about population and we think about the fact that, you know, as an industrialized, you know, developed country, um, our consumption levels are sky high, our waste levels are sky high. And you compare that to um, more populous parts of the world um, where, you know, you have a lot of, you know, places in Africa where there's a lot uh, of, of um, people but their contribution to climate change is very low. I think that also helps kind of frame, um, uh, like, in, in unpack uh, this this question of population. Um, you know, uh, I just, yeah, I, I I think about that, and I think about just the amount, um, you know, for example, of food we waste um, every year in the United States, and um, how how that 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 is a part of a con con uh, con a contribution to climate change and disruption and. And um, yeah, that, that's something that, th that this question makes me think about too. Great, thank you. Yeah, so, so, some estimates are that we're wasting 40% of the food we produce. The other thing to point out is that the United States population is less than 5% of the global population yet consumes over 25% of global resources. Yeah. Thank you. So for our last question, we're gonna combine two. One is 
from Lisa asking all of you, what do you see happening in PK through 12 schools? What might opportunities be there for schools? And then a follow up to that, following up on the, the um, plea actually from even Goodstein is how can we all push to make climate a class as early as possible and throughout education so that this becomes a part of what it means to be a responsible citizen in the United States, understanding these issues and their solutions. Well, you pushed about five of my buttons there all at once. Um, the first is climate should not be a class. Um, here is the first thing. Um, a class is a westernized uh, view of education in the first place. Um, and the second place is that climate is a symptom and not the root cause. Um, a lot of the root cause has to do with the fact that uh, people are disconnected from the natural ecosystems that support them. And that to the degree we push people into classrooms and disconnect them from nature and make them think about climate as an abstract thing that they talk about in the abstract, um, to that degree, um, I don't think we're going to solve the problem. If you wanted to know what I would talk about for K through 12, it would be getting people, getting, the, getting children the opportunity to reconnect directly and primarily to the ecosystems that support them, to think in whole systems and ask questions for themselves, at which point they will clearly see that climate is a problem, but is a symptom of the deeper systematic problems that we're looking at. And number two is, why does it have to be a class? Why is it not just simply part of the ethos of, you know, of, of our culture? If we stick it into a class and think that the class's job is to educate children on the thing, I think we failed. Thank you, Alan. Well, I know for a fact, because I know this person personally who asked the question, what can we do through K through 12 schools is exactly what she thinks needs to be done is re-engaging students with the natural world. In fact, she wrote a book on it. <laughs> what do you all think about education in the broadest sense? Forget the climate as a class thing, but how do we educate? Because I think Ellen's point is well taken. How do we get climate? How do we get this, all these issues, the systemic issue that results in climate change, do you think, into the education system? I, I can take a stab. At I don't know that I have a good answer for this, but, um, and, and Nina is probably gonna slap me on the back of the head when I say something like this, but like all those pictures that she was showing about the work that she had done out in the community. And we need young folks doing that. We need young folks standing right next to Nina when she's out there doing that, right? To see that, to be, that's their physical connection to the effects of what, what we're doing and what we can do about it. And then, Another anecdotal thing is we, you know, at Energy Alabama, we have uh, some different like lesson plans that we've done all the way down to probably first and second grade, but they're almost always games or ways to interact and try our best, right, uh, to connect uh, students to principles uh, and connect them to down to the technology. Like this is a really uh, crude way to put it probably, but like, the way I always try to explain it is like Bill Gates didn't become Bill Gates because he thought about something on a whiteboard, right? Or the people who invent new systems, the people who invent new technologies, like they're trying to get their hands dirty and learning about like down to the level of that stuff happening. Well, how do I make these things better? And so even at the high school level and some of the work that we've done, it's been exactly that. Like we're taking students in and having them learn the processes of energy auditing and how to uh, go through and design a solar array. That's how you're getting young folks saying, hey, wow, this is fun. Like we can make a big impact, right? Like this is fun to design a solar array and go in here and figure out how to do this. Oh, I can feed my family at the same time. Like that's really how we've been able, I feel like, even though I'd love to do 10X more than we do, I feel like we've had good success at lighting up young folks by doing exactly that literally just throwing them out there and saying, we're here to help, but you're about to do some fun stuff. Let's go. Fantastic. Yeah. And I'll say really, really quickly that um, there's nothing like, uh, you know, a good teacher. <laughs> 
Um, I think when I when I look back on um, uh, what I'm doing now with gas and all the other opportunities I've had to plug in in some way, shape or form, um, whether it be like, you know, through internships or volunteering or at the actual classroom, like somebody who actually takes the time um, to educate someone on what's going on can really transform a life. All, and it, it does all it takes sometimes is one good teacher that cares. And so, um, yeah, I, I think that, um, that that it it is important for for conversations like this to be had honestly right in in public schools alan said that climate change is just like one um symptom of the systemic problem that that this the systemic illness that we're trying to grapple with right now and so i think a little bit more honesty in the public education system would would help a lot in unpacking this conversation about climate change and in in, in uh, um other things um other problems that we're going through um you know uh in 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 our in our country so so yeah but i do think that um integrating this information into schools is important for sure well nina alan daniel i can't thank you enough for your contribution to this conversation and for the folks who've tuned in to have this conversation and as i said at the beginning i hope this will help trigger further conversation further engagement further engagement with organizations like Energy Alabama and GASP, the permaculture stuff that Alan has going on is so cool. So there's a niche for everybody, regardless of where your interests lie. And let's just all get together and get involved because we can solve climate by 2030.